that's uh, 2.30 or 12.30 or 10.30, depending on where you are. So we'll make a start. Uh, welcome to all those who've come along. Uh, Mark Ferguson from Next Gen Agri. Uh, I think I know most people on the on the call I can see there, but there's a few people I don't. So welcome along. Love, uh, great to have you along. Uh, so today's, today's talk is around do breeding values work? Uh, something that we end up talking about a lot. Uh, and and it follows on from the from the session we had on Monday night, which was great. We ended up people uh, having, which was great. We ended up having people hang around for 45 minutes after to have a chat, which was fantastic. So um, thanks very much for those that are coming along today again. Uh, some of the, I haven't got as much material today, but we've got we've got uh, got some material to to work through. So concept is we'll have an hour again, and we'll hang around after that if, if anyone's keen to have a chat. Um, probably got about enough material for 20 minutes uh, and then keen to have questions as we go through and some discussion, which makes it a lot easier. Um, you'll be aware that you can use your chat box. So scroll your mouse down to the bottom of the screen to, to see the chat box there and enter your questions in there. We'll try and monitor that as we go. Um, all I will be keeping uh, a check on who's muted and who's not, but uh, just unmute your microphone when you want to talk and then mute it again. Uh, we were Obviously, some of these we can run as uh, webinars. You will have, might have contributed to some of them where you don't have, where we can't see who you are and we can't uh, chat with you as easily. But we thought it was important to for people to have that that uh, that chat and that that option to talk to each other. So we've run it as a meeting. So um, it'd be just great to make that work if we can mute our microphones uh, as we go. Obviously, the key thing that we all I guess the whole reason the breeding values are important is because, because of this equation really that the phenotype, what we can see, what we can measure is not, uh, is not just genetics. It's such a combination of genetics and non-genetic factors. Um, so obviously the bit that we're trying to get at is the genetic bit, which, which transfers into our use and into our rams, uh, at home. But the reality is that what we see is, is often largely to do with the environment. So where they, where they were born, how well they've been fed, um, how old they were, how old their mum was, a whole heap of things that are going to what that animal looks like on a given day that aren't genetic. And that's the, the really important thing. Um, obviously it's not a silver bullet. A breeding value doesn't guarantee it's a productive sheep. It's got to have a lot of other things going for it as well. Um, and they don't work a hundred percent of the, there's, a breeding value on a young ram or bull that we get to buy has obviously got some is only, uh, normally moderate accuracy. So we know if we buy a few of them, then it'll breed like that. That team says it will, but each individual can can vary as we get more information about the animal. But it's way better than than using X-ray vision or guessing which which of those animals are going to be the much much productive. But it's still the most productive. Sorry, but it's still not a silver bullet. It still doesn't still doesn't mean that. Um, the computer can only give you the information that we feed in and that's part of the battle in the industry. And the reality is, I guess, and this is recap on, on Monday, but, um, and you will have seen this sort of stuff a thousand times, but the, it, it's worth hope, keep, keep remembering that most of what we see is not due to genes. So most traits are less than half heritable, um, except for fiber diameter. Um, a lot of the, the variation between individuals is more more of it is due to non-genetic factors than it is to genetics. So when we go in and we're looking at rams or bulls or ewes or, or cows, we're looking at what we're seeing and what we can measure is is more to do with how it's been raised, where it's been raised, how much feed it's had, whether it's a single or a twin in this case of sheep, um, how old it is, whether it's early in the drop, late in the drop, whether it's been housed, uh, and obviously nutrition's a massive thing and and as an industry, because us ram buyers and bull buyers have rewarded um, big shiny animals, uh, we've we've tended to reward animals that have been uh, the best prepared, and and that has sort of ended up with a with a a culture where preparation is a massive part of of the selling mechanism of of males, and that that's why breeding bays are so important because we need to separate what who the best feeder is or who the best preparer of animals is to who the best breeder of, of animals. And, and some of those factors don't matter as much if you're going to one place and looking at just the set of bulls or set of rams within one location. 
uh, because some of those factors are therefore accounted for because it's all in the one spot. They're all one contemporary group. Uh, but often you'd be looking across different uh, different driveways. You can go and get those genetics, and that gets really tough when you haven't when they haven't been running in the same paddock to actually work out what is genetic and what is just environment. Because again, only the bits that are genetic go to you get to take home and and put into your flocks or herds. So when it comes to what's in a what's in a breeding value, and again, we're just this is a recap, and we'll get onto some new stuff soon. Um, obviously, the measurement of the traits the critical thing. So if the tra if the animal's not not measured for that individual animal, it still could have a, a breeding value uh, for that trait. If it's been measured for some correlated traits, if they're if they're sort of moderately correlated traits, you'll often get quoted a breeding value as well. I think the important thing there is if you're using a, if you're looking at a breeding value that's really important to you it's in your top one or two traits that you are really important to you. You want to be making sure that that ram as or ram or bull has been measured for that trait. So you might be, um, you might be really focused on number lambs weaned and you want to be making sure that if you're, if you're grabbing buying rams and spending a lot of money on, on rams for that particular trait, you want to make sure that that your ram breeder is actually submitting the data in a sufficient way to get, um, get that animal with a, with the most accurate data you can. So measurement of the trait doesn't have to be there for every breeding value, but it's, if it's an important breeding value to you, you want to be making sure you're going to a ram breeder that, or a bull breeder that's actually measuring that information because different uh, ram or bull breeders uh, measure different stuff based on sometimes due to where to live, like where they live as in worms, things like worm resistance and that sort of thing where some people can't get a worm egg count up high enough every year to um, to get a reliable challenge and therefore don't have that data. Whereas other time, other places they can do that routinely. Uh, some breeders have different bents for different traits. So we'll be measuring different stuff. So worth having that conversation. I think, I guess part of what I really enjoy doing in, in our careers is, is helping people uh, have sort of useful conversations with their ram and bull breeders. Cause it's not, um, Everyone loves talking about sheep and cows, particularly anyone on this line. Um, and it's and it's good to have that conversation about what's being measured and and what's not. We need to we need to have that open conversation with the people that are providing our genes because it's an important part of of our farming operations. And we cover that on on Monday night around that. There's those thirty opportunities in your farming career to get the right genes into your flocks and herds. And so, spending a bit of time thinking about think about these things is important. So obviously uh, nutrition and management are, are key things that need to be taken out of a breeding value or taken out from a phenotype through to a breeding value. And so those two, those things are normally accounted for by the contemporary group. So really critical key underpinning part of, of breeding values is that, that us service providers and, and breeders themselves make sure we submit the data in a way that, that the system can understand which animals have been running together and which ones haven't. Um, so that those factors can be can be taken out of the equation. And you'll often hear of ram breeders or bull breeders that are trying to feed up their bulls to before they measure them for carcass traits or make sure they're heavy for this or uh, or whatever. But the reality is animals, to get that breeding value calculated, only ever get compared within their contemporary group. And then we use the genetic linkage to to compare those contemporary groups across different uh, different farms and different management. So it doesn't matter whether they weigh 40 kilos or, or 70 kilos at, at post weaning weight, for example, um, because they're only being compared as a, as a mob average, because they're only being compared within that contemporary group. Um, age of the animals dam is, is also accounted for. So obviously two tooth or ewe lambs or ewe hoggets, um, depending whether which side of the ditch you live. Um, or two tooth ewes versus a mixed age ewe, um, that all can impact on a range of those range of those traits, and that is accounted for in the in the system. Obviously, in in sheep, twin triplet uh, is really important. Um, lots of factors, and we've got a couple of them I'll cover again. That are uh, that are important. Uh, that so being a twin does have an impact on lots of measured traits, uh, and obviously, single lambs always look look better generally um, and so that needs to be accounted for and that's a kid, critical thing uh, pedigree is pretty much what underpins a breeding value without pedigree they can't work uh, and that makes sense because it's genetic uh, evaluation and it's trying to understand what 
what is genetic. So if you don't tell it who they're related to, it can't do anything. Um, and the more pedigree, the better, basically. And the depth, the depth of pedigree is a really critical part, particularly when we get into less accurate traits or less, sorry, less heritable traits like reproduction and traits that need lots of data to become, uh, to get an accuracy threat, to meet their accuracy threshold or to meet, to become useful. Um, the deeper that pedigree and the more information that's measured in that pedigree, the better they go. Something like really heritable traits like Micron, you don't need a lot of information to get a fairly reliable number. But for most traits, you need a good pedigree to get a reliable information. And it just, I think as we all would, all would uh, conclude that maternal traits are absolutely critical to all our production systems. Um, we talked about our bull breeding bees on our Zoom call the other night with, with members and clients and, and it's, and the fertility of a, of a beef cow is absolutely critical. If it's not bringing it, it doesn't matter about any other trade. If it's not bringing in a calf and it's, it's value to an enterprise is, is close enough to zero. Um, and so while we like to have complex breeding programs, absolutely underpinning that is fertility. And if you haven't got, if you're not recording pedigree and you're not matching up animals with their dams, then, then it's impossible to know which ones are actually bringing in those lambs. And so, um, Damn pedigree is a critical thing and we're getting more into that in the sheep industry for the same reason that even in a wool enterprise, uh, like a really wool focused enterprise, many of them are still pulling in 50 or 60% of their income is coming from uh, lambs and surplus sheep sales. And that's, if the current market sits like it is, um, that will be even greater the next, next year or two. So it um, doesn't matter which way we look at it, fertility is important. Um, and so having that pedigree helps us really separate, not just account for um, all the other traits, but, but also in its, in a, as a trait in itself. And the other thing that's, uh, well, the other couple of things that are taken into account in the breeding value is the heritability of the trait. Um, obviously that, that's, so that's proportion of, of the variation between individuals that's due to genetics. Uh, so if you're comparing a couple of animals in the same contemporary group, some of that will be so the bits that you, um, yeah, some of that variation is is just yeah, non-genetic effects. Some of that, whether they're twins, whether they're born out of an older ewe, whether they're born the first week or last week of lambing, that sort of stuff. And then some of that is just through due to the genes itself. And and that's an important component of, of the breeding value, obviously. And that's the great thing, I guess, about a breeding value is that you don't need to know all this stuff because it's all been taken into account. By the time you're looking at a number, you're looking at the number that will transfer into your into your uh, flock or herd. That's what you can expect. And the difference between two animals that you're comparing, the, the difference you see in their breeding value is what, or half of that difference is what you'd expect to, to transfer into your, into your flock or herd. And the final thing, which is important for some traits is, is that correlated traits, which I covered at the start. So if, if they've measured for weaning weight and yet and they weren't measured for post weaning weight, they'd still have a post weaning weight breeding value because, because those two traits are fairly highly correlated. Um, so lots of times, but also that helps hone that, that breeding value a little bit. If it's just, a um, to, to improve the reliability of that breeding value, if there's measured for lots of traits that are correlated, those, those correlations can be taken into account and, and end up with a number that's, that's more use. So, uh, lots of stuff you probably already know, but worth really working out why, I guess people like us are so passionate about, about breeding value use in the industry because it, it is really a, a pretty solid system that's used to, to help us achieve genetic gain, which at the end of the day is what we're all, all about. So we're going through some, I mean, the title, the title of this talk was Do Breeding Bays Work? And so now I'm going to provide some evidence that they do. And I'm not sure how many on the line would, uh, would think they don't work, but, um, but just it's always great to see when we, when we put them out on, on test that, that they do what they, what we think they can do. The story I told Monday night was, is one of my PhD where I was relatively skeptical on, on breeding bees, um, even though we were starting to use them and really wanted to know where they worked and, and having sort of embedded myself in, in trying to understand the physiological difference between different sheep with different breeding bees um, that was in Merinos and in carcass traits. But it was just amazing the number of things from hormone profiles to, to their milk production, to their growth, to their how they handled their fat stores, everything was it could um, was related to their breeding base. So we were fundamentally 
So it proved, showed to me that we were fundamentally shifting animals through, through this tool. And as I've gone on, we've had the, the privilege and the pleasure of working with lots and lots of different people now that have, that have absolutely changed their production systems by starting to use, the, use this tool to its, to its true uh, effect and actually starting to shift the type of sheep and, and, and end up um, shifting their total production system and, and not just through, I guess, more productivity, but also saving costs and saving money and, and improving welfare by getting it all right. And that's, that's the exciting thing of, of genetics. And that's why I get out of bed every morning, even though it was a bit slower than average some days, but it's, uh, but it is a great, uh, great, great part of the industry to be, to be working in. So beef cattle is where we'll start just a couple of slides here from, um, from beef and lamb genetics. Uh, this is, a progeny test that's been running here since I think this was the 2016 drop maybe um, and so they've been running some sort of I guess proof of concept type type trials but also progeny testing animals in, in their own right um, they've been across a few different breeds there Simmental, um, Hereford and Angus and that's just their weaning weight breeding value of the sire versus the average of their progeny Obviously, there's no dots on there, so that's just the line, the correlation between the two. Um, and the slope there is 0.41. You would expect if it was working 100%, um, if that, that slope would be 0.5. So 50% of, of the breeding value translates into, into, the, into the calf. And that's because obviously because only half the genetics comes from the side, the other half coming from the dams, which in this case in any progeny test is normally randomized. So you can't, um, so there'll be no impact on that, but still pretty solid, still solid evidence that, um, that breeding values do work and you don't always get your one, your exact uh, transfer of, of what you would expect. There's, and there's other factors are involved, but it's still, um, still way better than the, the chance that you would do that by, by random chance that you would, uh, you would achieve that. I guess one thing that's important and something we need to sort of we cover a bit is um, is that kind of does breed matter? Does breeding objective matter? If you do, you call it. I got asked a question the other day, like if if you're farming sheep, what type of sheep would you have? And I guess I'm a bit anti getting focused on breeds and and more focused on the set of traits that make you money or the set of traits that you enjoy producing or that your country can produce, and then you just pull together the genes that that make the most or are, are do that best and so I don't think breed or even breeding objective discussions are that uh, relevant. Uh, if you want to breed black cattle, you breed black cattle. Um, if you want to breed super fine spinners wool, you breed super fine spinners wool. It's about applying those tools regardless of what the type of sheep you want to produce or the type of cattle you want to produce. Um, because often there's non, some of those impact, some of those reasons you've got, uh, you can explain easily because they're logical and then others are just emotive and, and the same reason you, you buy the brand of boots you do or, or there's a whole heap of stuff that we as humans do that we don't necessarily explain or can, can explain. We just do it and that's what we want to do. And that's, and that's, I don't think there's any point arguing that fact. It's more about if you want to do that, how, would, how do we do it the best we can? So obviously there's a big crossover between, between breeds of cattle as there is in sheep. Um, and there's always a good argument if you get some Hereford breeders and some Angus breeders in the same room to talk about which one's best. Um, that's that same progeny test data back. This is out to 400 day weight now. And this is every of those bars is an average of the sire. Um, the yellow bars being Hereford's and the black bars being Angus. And I guess the important thing there is there's as much variation within a breed as there is between a breed. And so arguing about, I'm going to go for Angus because they grow faster. Um, some do and some don't. And the same is true for every trait. Uh, so it's often not about the breeds and, and even that to a certain extent, you can say the same about breeders. There's, a, there's often as much genetic variation within, within the one flock as there is between flocks. And so it really, um, you've got the opportunity to make the most of those selection decisions, regardless of, of your particular bent on breeder or, or breed. Someone going to help me out with a comment yet? Just go silent for a while. Mark, just, just a comment that half of the graph is covered by um, by the list of participants. Is there any 
Oh, can you, you can grab that and shift that with your mouse, I think. Oh, okay, thank you. That's all right. And you can change where you, you can put it up or down or left or right. Um, yep. Um, yeah, and that is one of the, I guess, one of the challenges we're finding with this online space is trying to make sure the video is in the right spot. Um, obviously, we build, we used to build slides to stand in front of people in wool sheds, but we have to get used to putting the, the getting the getting it built so the, the video can be in the right spot. But we're learning. Um, I showed this one uh, on Monday night, but I think it's uh, there's three graphs in a row. Um, so this is our central project test data coming out in New Zealand. Every dot is a is a side group, or oh, sorry, there's two dots for each side group. On the bottom of the so on the on your horizontal axis is the clean fleece weight breeding value for those particular. These are all thymol rams, obviously. Um, so when we talk about clean fleece weight breeding value, it's quoted in percentages, and so it's so a twenty percent is is a is a animal that genetically will cut 20% more wool uh, than the average of the database when it started back in the nineties. And so that's the way you can view those, those data on the, on your vertical axis is the average fleece weight of the progeny. So of those, so these are sires that have gone in over random use artificially inseminated, and then the average of their progeny being calculated. Um, the caveat is that the, uh, that data is in those breeding values. So it is, Obviously, that line is tighter because that those individual animals are being are being accounted for there. Um, but each of those sides, being progeny test sides, have lots of progeny elsewhere, and most of them have several across a number of flocks or a number of progeny. So it's not um, it's not overly weighted to this data. But just just a caveat there that there is um, it looks better than it would be if it was you took home a sire and used it over random random sheep. But the critical thing there, obviously, is that breeding values do work. The higher breeding value sires are producing progeny with more fleece weight. Um, the other thing to, I guess, and the reason I'm putting the graphs up is is that twin effect. So each of those um, yellow dots is the twin progeny from those sires, twin born progeny. And then the, the black dots are the single born progeny from those sires. And you can see on pretty much most of those occasions, the single born progeny are sitting cutting more wool than than the twins and so these are the we need to think about when we're if we're buying rams and we don't have a breeding bee um then we'll be and, we're, and fleece weight's important to us and we've just got a raw fleece weight in front of us our tendency obviously is to buy a single born ram because those fleece weight will be higher on on most occasions and that's that's what a breeding bee takes into account and removes that when you're looking at a clean fleece weight breeding value for a young sire, that's already been taken into account. Um, there's some there. On that. Sorry to jump in. You're all right, mate. Uh, yeah, just wondering about uh, weather trials, um, whether the weather was born a twin or a single, how that impacts the information coming from a weather trial and the relevance of those trials. Yeah, so if I was entering a team of weathers in a weather trial, I'd make sure they were single born out of my four year old ewes. <laughs> and and you would have, and we'll, the next graph's going to be my fiber diameter. So yeah, big impact of, um, and this is just, this is born. So we don't actually know which ones are rare twins until you would have another effect here. So this is a follicle difference effect, a follicle density effect. So single born lambs have a better uterine environment and therefore have more secondary follicle branching during that late pregnancy phase and are therefore set up to produce more wool for their lives. Um, and that, yeah, that will be all at play in a, in a weather trial. So in a weather trial where you, um, despite the fact you can't, um, where you, yeah, if, if you just got a random selection, um, then that's okay. But if back in the old, I guess the old days, weather trials where you'd put in six or 10 or whatever, um, most of them had horns because they'd just been castrated. But, um, the, yeah, the, there's some massive differences in those phenotypic performance and that, that isn't genetic, it's just the fact you've picked the right ones. So you had a handle, just to take that a step further, if we looked at the single born and removed them from the class and race, and then looked at the twin born and compared the twin born and the twin raised, as opposed to single raised, how big an impact is left between those two categories? Uh, it's much reduced, yeah. So I haven't got that here, because in this data set, we do all DNA pedigrams, so we don't know who's rare twin. Um, but, it is, we did that in lifetime wool days. Um, particularly you have an impact on those first shearing a little bit, but the predominant effect is this, is this 
follicle setup effect, which is is the what's occurred by the time they're born. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Um, same data set, just a different trait. So now looking at fibre diameter, now it is the most heritable trait there is. So literally, with, this is probably the only trait where you can just say, well, breeding bees are, are nice, but you don't need them because um, unless you're Alistair Campbell and breeding right down the pointy end, because literally, if you're blind, you could select and make gain on, on fibre diameter because it is so heritable. But I'll, I'll reverse out of that in saying that that's okay if that was single trait selection like we did in the in the micro madness days. Um, but when you're trying to, to balance this trait with other traits, uh, that's when you need a breeding value to, to make sure you don't ruin everything else as you take them finer. Um, but again, uh, because of that secondary follicle branching, all the twin born progeny in most of those, in most of those um, sire groups are, are actually broader. So those twin born lambs, if you're just buying that single, if you're going into a ram sale and you don't have a breeding bay and micron and fleece weight are important to you, then you're likely to take home a trail load of, of singles because they'll be, when they've been measured, they will be finer. Um, the single born rams will be finer and will be cutting more wool based on that secondary follicle branching that happens in late pregnancy uh, and not based on their genetics. So they'll, they'll all, they'll, they'll breed to their, to their genes, but phenotypically they're, they're finer than they would be if they were a twin. And so across there, it's sort of it's normally about half a micron. Some of those sizes are, are greater than that in terms of um, the impact of that, that, uh, that environment on, on their phenotypic uh, micron. The other thing there, again, this data has got that, that their own uh, data in those sire breeding bees, um, but still there's a, obviously a very clear case that if you want to shift micron, um, the breeding bays will work really, really well. And just the last uh, slide on that, on those, that particular trial, um, and there's lots more of those, but we'll move on. But um, wrinkles, another one that, there's, there's lots of flocks out there that are moving away from are trying to go planar for, for a heap of reasons. Um, again, we have to be careful that if we're going in and we're selecting rams that are that are peer planar, um, genetically they might not be as planar as they seem. So single part of that skin development, part of that good uterine environment when they're growing up is that they'll have more wrinkle. And many people have, will have seen this in, if they're tagging singles versus twins. The twin born lambs are always um, planar. The lambs out of um, young sheep are always plainer, have less less wrinkle. So again, if wrinkle is really important, then you want to be making sure that you're using the breeding bee, the, e, the early breech wrinkle breeding bee. Um, and the more negative it is, the less skin wrinkle they'll have. Uh, and and using the breeding bee will separate some of that some of that chaff out and, and allow you to take home the wheat. Is it a single step for triplets first? Do they go to the next level again, or is it flat um, with the twins? All of my data that I've ever analysed, we end up shoving the. There's def never been enough numbers in the triplets. Um, when I've analysed stuff, not saying there's not flocks out there that I couldn't do that on, but yeah, I've never had. Um, so they end up being just chucked in the multiple category. But um, logic says that their environment is tougher again, uh, and so I think yeah, I think you would see a further. If, yeah, if some of these correlations would go out would go out further, um, but yeah, the majority of the data out there back in the good old days and lifetime wool days when we we're doing a lot of that work, the, we were pretty happy with 120, 130 percent, so we didn't have to deal with too many triplets. But she's a, it's a different world now with lots of with people starting to get um, some numbers of triplets around the place. So, can I ask Chad a question? Yeah, it depends on your what quality response you expect. <laughs> Chad, I was wondering if you, if you, this particular slide that's up in front of us now, the, well, the early breech wrinkle slide is one that you've um, used and, and how effective has it been? At uh, pulling uh, well, I think, I think, Jamie, the path we've been breeding for has put us in a position to be low breech wrinkle. And so now that we've got breeding values to actually measure our phenotype with, it's showing that you know they're around that minus one, so it does seem to be a very effective tool, like all other breeding values, uh, depending on the trait you're looking to, to select. 
Uh, this is for three years of central, no, it might be more than that, four years of central progeny test data out of New Zealand. Um, uh, yielding, clean, uh, yielding fat breeding value and the condition score of, the, of their daughters at, at, the first, at their first mating. So this is, sire so goes in, gets uh, into central progeny test, goes across random ewes. These progeny within their contemporary groups all got run together um, from conception. And then this is the condition score of their U at first mating. And there's, a, there's a, a few different cohorts in here. So the um, so it tightens up if I put all them out individually. But one of the things that's, that we've found really important in places with 100-day winters and and 150-day summers is, is having U's that genetically line themselves up to be in good condition, something that I've obviously been on about a fair bit. Um, but the great... What we're really, I guess, and I was fat and muscle was part of my PhD and, and been a real long, a big part of my journey. But but what we are gen, just doing is essentially breeding sheep that are in good condition when running in exactly the same conditions as other other new groups that that have the same opportunity that are in the same paddock, got the same grass, got the same everything, um, yet volunteer a condition score lighter uh, across that. Some of them volunteer a condition score lighter, and so we all know. Most of us have been through some pretty tough times over the last few years and and have seen our supplementary feed bills uh, and sheep that actually don't need to to be fed either as early or as much um, is a massive part of is a massive part of dealing with the climate extremes and climate variability that we get to that seem to be becoming more common so um, one thing that I'm really passionate about is is breeding sheep that will look after themselves and cattle the same way we've got cattle on on pretty tough country in New Zealand and having enough genetic uh, fat in there to protect them is, is really important. But um, an exciting sort of release that's about to happen to, to Merinos. We'll have our first research breeding bays. I don't know, Gus, have we got them today or they, they're not far away um, for condition score? Yeah, they're, they're coming. Yeah. Um, Next um, this this month next month anyway soon. Yeah. Um, so so does that, do these those results as food with you? Does that go through as a four with you? Yeah. Yep. So these are two with you's, but um, what we've seen is that it flows through to be sheep that yeah just generally do it easier right the way through. Yeah. Um, this we ran out. Well, we stopped funding the work to go any further than that eventually, but. There's people on the line that have seen high fat sheep that just, yeah, you just, they end up being sheep that maintain condition regardless of, of the conditions. I've just realized I haven't looked at the chat, so I should probably do that. Uh, Alan, your question about data set that was, um, so each of those sire groups was about 25 to 30 progeny. All our central progeny tests, we aim, we AI 50 use. Uh, so every dot, on that graph that we're looking at now, we'll have something like 30 progeny sitting behind it. Uh, sorry, there's a use, so it'd be yeah, 15 progeny sitting behind it. Um, yeah, so we, for most traits, you can get a pretty accurate breeding value if you've got uh, 15 to 20 progeny, depending on the heritability of the trait. Um, does that the, mean a... I've seen put in the, the dates for Merinos, for the RBVs, to get the June run. Oh, cool. Yeah. So 5th of June, we'll have um, research breeding values for condition score. Obviously, they'll be within flock at, at this stage, but but as all research breeding values, it takes, once we've got them in, as, once they're in that form, then eventually they become ASBVs. So um, so that's a, yeah, just another tool that will, and it's, I think the correlations with fat and muscle are sort of 0.8 or something. They're quite high, but it's a, it's a, an, going to be another tool, another good tool to have. Well, what was your point on wool traits versus? I was just answering the point before from Mark about does uh, we're talking about the wool traits. Yeah. Does that mean a twin scan's not as good? And I think it would for the wood, but for, uh, for your wool traits. But I just replied to him in my view that the 
Uh, raised a twin and born a twin is very important for that weaning weights and stuff like that because of the nutrition and the milk and the whatever. So yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I just answered to him. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Buff. Yeah, so yeah, for the world traits, it's sort of locked in by yeah by the time they're born essentially, but but you can still have a maternal effect on that as well. But yeah, for all the other traits, we ideal to know what they're read of uh, read as, and particularly important, obviously, if if we're trying to get number of lambs weaned or the new race uh, new um, reproduction breeding moves we need to know all that stuff so that we can so we know which daughters uh, are losing one or or both lambs um, and that can be can go into their breeding moves and, and that's important as well um, just on number of lambs wean this is some data I just grabbed out of the uh, so the Balmoral side of the lifetime productivity trial I just grabbed there the ewe progeny, the three-year-old ewe progeny weaning percentages, and then looked up their breeding values on the on the system. Um, looked up the breeding, the NLW breeding values for their sires on the system. Pretty much all those sires had five or six different flocks with a lot of different progeny. So, although I think that data is now in, I think the MLP data is now in their number of lambs weaned breeding value. I'm not hundred on that, but even though that is in there, we're still seeing a pretty pretty good correlation with. And those sires have fairly accurate breeding ways for number of lambs weaned now. But again, it's one of those traits that we probably think is the least, the most rubbery because it's only 5% um, heritable, the trait. So that means it's 95% of what we're looking at is is due to other stuff. And that's because, as we know, you get a you get a, a snowstorm or you get a, a blizzard day or you get, there's heaps of reasons why lambs uh, find ways to, to, to expire. And uh, and so this trait is, yes, there's lots of reasons why this trait here would be the trait is low. But even with a trait that is, that's the, sort of the worst case scenario, you can still see a pretty good correlation between what is what the breeding value is saying is happening, and what uh, what is actually happening. It's a trait you've got to really have a good chat with your ram breeder about about what they're putting in, what they're not putting in. Um, if it's something that's really important to you, you want to be making sure the person that that's selling you the rams is is actually getting all the information in. It's it's obviously the hardest trait to get everything in. You need to put the, it's not hard, but it's it's the most complex trait where you've got three or four different time periods where you've got to be getting the information in in a in the right format. And that just um, and so up until recently, we've had very few flocks that have been doing that. It's great to see that we're getting more and more all the time. That through using technology or or whatever, are starting to get more pedigree and therefore getting more information going in but it's i couldn't i uh, couldn't say strongly enough that we need more information that's going in we've got new breeding bees um, which um, are coming out 5th of june which uh, will be rbvs will be research breeding bees which will split it split number of lambs weaned into conception litter size and u rearing ability which is going to be even better than the nlw but uh but yeah if if it's important to you then you really need to be finding someone that's actually doing all the hard work to to get the number Uh, minus 20 is a real thing, Chad. Yes, for NLW. I don't. I think the variation is something like mine. I haven't actually looked lately. I used to. I think it was. I think you go down to beyond that. I think it's minus 40 or something is the last in the database. Anyway, there's the sheep that aren't that keen on counting or even having anything to count. Um. I talked about this the other night, but again, MLP data, just, I just grabbed a couple of different data sets, just showing the importance of, of how breeding bees sort of, why they work, I suppose. If you're going to two different ram sales or two different bull sales and you're trying to compare animals, um, really, really tough as soon as you're, as soon as they're out of contemporary groups, uh, without any data, it's, I mean, it's hard enough with, the, with uh, hard enough within a flock without any data, but if you start swapping across different places and trying to compare animals, it gets really tough. Um, so these are different sites, but two sides that we use at each of those sites. And so you've got a flock that's doing, well, you've got a ram that's, that's producing, well, the progeny are sitting around whatever, 40 kilos live weight, um, cutting 3.2 kilos, the exact same genetics used somewhere else over different use admittedly, but different, completely different nutrition are cutting five and a half kilos and at 67 kilos. So really impossible to compare those those flocks and those sheep. But the beauty of, of genetic linkage is that that's how it all works by using those rams in common 
at both those sites, they become the benchmark and allow you to compare those animals. And so great to see that the blue ring tire there is, is cutting less wool at both places, but he's also heavier live weight at both places. And that's, that's how we don't see, um, we don't see very much what's called genetic by environment interaction. So if, if they re ranked, that would, that would make it really tough for us to do genetic evaluation. In fact, it would make it pretty impossible, but, very rarely do we see re-ranking occur. We see this phase shift happen where they cut a heap more wool, but still within those groups, generally the size will stay in the same rank for each of those traits. So um, yeah, amazingly powerful tool really to, for us to use. So I guess the question's not really whether they work or they don't, although that's something I used to have spent a lot of time arguing that and I don't anymore because I've seen it work, them work so often that it's just, um, that we just know it works and we know it works in pine trees and shrimp and chooks and pigs and whatever. That's a system that if you can take out the, the error, then you can, um, then you can, then you've got a, a set of information left that you can make a really good selection decision on. And that's, that's breeding values. Um, again, this is data modified from the Balmoral MLP site where I've grabbed, grabbed information and just curated, created the fleece weight to body weight ratio and then compared it to the weaning percentage. And this is sort of repeating some work from Herselman out of South Africa. Um, so the question's not in my mind whether breeding those work or they don't. It's about how you combine them to breed your perfect sheep and, and how you deal with the trade-offs. And that's when, that's when breeding bees and, and weighting them separately and, and understanding them becomes really critical because it's not, it's easy for me to select for fleece weight or for body weight or for, muscle depth or whatever a single trait with or without the with a breeding value you can you can make some gain you'll make more gain if you do with a breeding value but where they really come into their own is where you're trying to do do multiple things so obviously in a merino sense you're trying to have lots of lambs and and lots of wool and some of those things and and across most of the things we breed there's there's positive and neg and unfavorable genetic correlations that we have to work through and this is not a genetic correlation I've got up there. That's just a phenotypic performance uh, difference um, at their three-year-old three-year-old shearing, at their three-year-old joining weight, and then how they went on and reproduced. But what we see across lots of data sets is if the more fleece weight you jam on an animal at a given body weight, uh, their reproduction starts to fail in terms of kilograms of lambs weaned or just total number of lambs weaned. And, and that's, in my head, that's a, a, a sensible biological response. Um, where you sit on that graph is up to you and, and whether animals can handle that differently um, is, is where we really get, that's where it gets interesting with breeding. So it's not that you definitely, therefore you can't cut heavy fleece weight. You can't have heavy cutting merinos that have some, have lots of lambs, but if you're going to do that, you're against biology and therefore it takes some serious bit of breeding to do that. So I think, um, this is where it really gets interesting in my mind is that where we're starting to try to fight genetic correlations and or fight, fight uh, bio, biology that, that, that is against what they, what the natural, the normal distribution of progeny would be. Any comments or questions? It flows on, does it, Ferg, from not just serious genetic stuff, but your management becomes so much more important and probably your cost of production will go up as well if you want that high fleece weight animal giving you good lambing results. It makes that importance of spot on management and probably more supplementary feeding, whatever, so your costs and that it, it really flows onto there, doesn't it? They're not as forgiving, maybe. Yep, and I think it's that's true. Like you yeah, you've you put both those things together and you've built yourself a Ferrari and you, you can't then yeah, run that, run that Ferrari and on a, on a dirt track, you've actually got a, yeah, you have got a high performance animal and they will respond to high performance management for sure. Uh, and you, we see that. And I think, I think that equates to where the systems with a low stocking rate, um, where sheep are part of a grazing, uh, part of a cropping situation and they're not, then they're often quite in good, good order. Then you can have sheep that, um, can do amazing things because they're generally fat. But um, I guess what we tend to see is in specialist sheep production systems or in areas where it's 100 day winters or a long summer, or but where you're actually stocking rates are a key part of what you're trying to achieve, then, then those high performance sheep become, or those where you're trying to get a lot out of those sheep becomes, becomes tough. And you need to really think hard about how you put that sheep together. And that's where 
that's the great part of I think of of breeding is is trying to trying to combine traits and trying to bring them all into one animal as well as worry about the phenotype and the type of wool you like or the type of cattle you like the coat color or whatever there's a heap of other things that are going on as well as just balancing these breeding moves and that's that's the exciting part but um, is there a way, uh, is there a way before you move on just to talk well is there some easy way that people can get their head around the antagonisms with different traits we can combine all our favorite traits but they've often got uh they bring problems with them is that if it was all on one page to see if we increase fleece weight, for example, what that does to micron, what it does to growth, what it does to reproduction or staple length, just to show the negative effects of selecting uh, one trait to a higher level and to then give people a better grip of selecting a balance of traits, if they could see on one page somehow, how will those traits interact? Yeah, so the book that I wrote that Sheep's RC sort of had published was, yeah, had each of those for every trait, it had their like the favorables and the unfavorable correlations. Um, that's, I found that still, you can still get a PDF, that, PDF of that. I think there's versions of that on the Sheep Genetics website maybe. Um, but yeah, I'd take that on Would notice. That bring that into, well, yeah, just wondering if, uh, if we had a, a whole range of traits in a bar graph on a screen that was interactive where we could drag fleece weight up and see what the likely effect might be on, on reproduction or growth or drag growth up and see what that does or drag micron down and see something that could actually give people a visual it's well beyond my pay grade you'd be the sort of bloke to get hold of that right? yeah right we'll take that on on notice and, and have a think about that and i guess the i guess the important thing is yeah a we need to understand what they are but b we need to also accept that um that by using your using your selection advantage and cruising around looking at different animals, you can actually find animals that, that don't go along with the genetic correlations. And that's sort of part of the, part of the, the lolly scramble when it comes to buying rams is trying to find those animals that are, that are breaking some of the genetic correlations or, or because there's always animals that are different to the norm, but yeah, it would, um, it would be an interesting, uh, if I've got a spare day or seven, I'll have a crack at that chat. Has a Ram Select trying to do that? Ram Select initially when it was launched by the CRC was a disaster because, in my view, because you could just drag everything you wanted, it just became a wish list. So everybody just dragged to the right, you know, 100% wool cut, mark on a heap, heaps number lambs weaned, without any of what Chad and you were talking about. But I haven't been back to that for a while, but haven't they modified that? So if you shift something to the right, um, you've got to give something up. You've you sort of, you limited the 100% in your breeding value. So if, if, if my memory serves me correct, we might have that tool chat. Yeah, right. I haven't, I don't know, I haven't had a look, but. That'd be good, book if we do it somewhere. Um, and I guess, yeah, so there is some correlations out there we're fighting against. Uh, I'll just put this up because it's a flock that I work with in my PhD with the Marino Tech WA flock. Um, Ian Robertson is the man I'm referring to there, not that it's a man's game, but um, he has achieved some pretty amazing things. And I could have six other graphs here at the same genetic rate. And it just does show if you do everything right, and there's lots of there's guys, lots of people on this call that have that have achieved genetic gain at the same rate. But the ability to achieve um, amazing things in terms of consistently improving 10 different traits, as well as improving the phenotype in terms of wool quality uh, and um, structural traits and amount of smart and a whole heap of other things that have slightly in, improved as well, then it just shows you if you have a really um, stringent, uh, if you stick to the, stick to good data structure, do it, measure everything right and keep all your contemporary groups and do everything uh, to the book, then, then your ability to make genetic gain is great. And you also make genetic gain in things that don't want to go together, like producing, increasing fleece weight and increasing fat, for example, they are, negatively correlated not massively but they are so this is each of those dots is the average of the average of those um, of the progeny from that year drop and you see there that every year they've got a bit more fleece weight and a bit more fat and a bit more muscle and they've improved their coefficient of variation and i could have a staple strength flock uh, graph i could have a worm egg count graph so by using the tool um you can achieve great things with with um with breeding bees and and that's where i think that's the opportunity as commercial ram buyers and bull buyers is to, is that we can essentially float along behind the people that are breeding these, these sheep that are breaking correlations and are achieving great things by, by buying the right ones. 
So we're just about to sum it up, uh, just about to wrap it up. But um, yeah, just uh, just yeah, appreciate all the, the comments that have gone through. I won't disappear uh, straight away. So happy to sit around for a chat. Um, that's what I do, talk about sheep generally. Uh, but if you like what you're seeing and you're not part of Next Gen Agri already, we'd love to have you on board. Um, our, we've just launched our Next Gen Sheep Breeding course, which is, yeah, as I said at the start, we're getting some really good, great feedback. And thanks again to the to the people that have gone through it early and provided some comment. We're just I just shot a bit more film today to add to it, just to to tidy up a few things that that people thought weren't clear. But that's that's the I guess the benefit of online. We can we can modify and we can keep moving. So it's uh, it's on our website now for you to check out and and have a look. We'd love to you to uh, sign up to that. And we have Zoom calls every fortnight uh, with our members and clients, um, where we update on on. Uh, on whatever's relevant at the time. We've had the Sheep Genetics team on. We have, um, we've had researchers on from, from all over the place and we do that every fortnight. So one of these happens every Thursday. Uh, generally we shift the time around a bit to, to suit uh, people. Uh, and yeah, we'd love, love you to check that out. And we have a closed Facebook group as part of that and a, a Sunday newsletter from me. Um, and then they get deals on, on, uh, on any of the courses that we're rolling out. We were going online before COVID-19 hit. Um, it's just actually managed to keep me in the office long enough to, 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 to provide some of this stuff. So um, yeah, we see a, a big opportunity. We think obviously farmers are busy people and getting out there, uh, getting off farm to go to field days all the time or go to go to workshops is, is, is hard and is often expensive and often cuts into a day. Whereas we see if you can come inside for an hour um, and get the information and, and get back with onto the job, um, then that's a that's a huge opportunity, and that's what we're sort of working towards, as well as our on farm consulting as well and our, our project work. But we see this as a, a really great add on. So we'd love your feedback. Um, stay around for a chat if you've got any questions. But uh, thanks very much for your time, and we'll see you somewhere on the virtually or hopefully when we get out and about uh, in real life. Uh, I can provide a link. Yeah, sorry, Mike. I'll um, that'll go out when we put this video up. So the video last Monday's video is on the website uh, under our articles section, and this one will go up uh, by tomorrow night, I think. Um, and so we'll shove, uh, we'll put the link to that that booklet that the Sheep CRC has uh, published. Um, I'm in about halfway through re rewriting that, um, but not sure. I won't, I won't promise when that will be. Any questions? Hey, Berg, it's Jill. Um, I was just wondered, is there negative correlation, like all those negative correlation type things, is there, I might, you might have said it, but my phone went into Toby's car, um, about the, uh, the cattle? Yeah, the correlations, well, when I've hunted for them, they're not as easy to find as they are in, in sheep. Um, that link we put up, uh, after last after Will's talk, we had a few correlations in that, but not many. So I haven't. Yeah, I'd have to go hunting, but we can we can look for them. All right, thank you. And is there a um a P? You know how there's the the score condition score one you're going to do for the sheep? Is there one for cattle as well? Someone was telling me about the Angus in uh, the USA have a like a doability kind of uh, ABV. Uh. Pass, I think. I mean, rib fat, rump fat, are there, but I haven't heard of um, do a bit after take that on notice as well, Jill. Right, thank you. Uh, so, Alan, per, sorry, per, there's not. obviously there's a relationship between eye muscle area and the yield of that animal. Uh, as in dressing percentage? Yeah. 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 So I can't remember where it is, but it's. Um, uh, I did look it up not that long ago. I can flick it to you, but yeah, there's a favourable correlation. Higher, higher muscling sheep tend to have higher dressing percentages. I think it was might have been half a percent per mil. Yeah. Um, I can't remember, but I did. There's a couple of papers that um, yeah, come out of Australia on that. Uh, Alan, I'm not a guru on epigenetics, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think there is, I think the breeding values are a great tool, but they're never going to be perfect because there is things like that we don't understand about sort of permanent environmental effects and stuff that, um, and epigenetic effects where you've got, yeah, 
a nutritional change three generations ago is still having an impact and that sort of stuff is I think is will definitely be at play and yeah I'm the first to admit that's that gets gets me into the same head spin that trying to understand where the end of the universe is um but uh there's definitely yeah I think there's definitely those things that are at, at play but I guess for ram buyers who are trying to get the right right set of uh, males to breed great ewes and bulls to breed great cows then then that level of error is probably um not huge and i guess all the things i've ever seen is that yes sometimes it doesn't work 100 percent like you like you would like it to but it's always way better than what would be the random chance or or trying to select on just phenotype so yeah i think epigenetics will having a will be having a playing a role but um yeah it's beyond me to to get there i guess that's the more we know the more data we get the more we can understand those things and we are i think i was sort of thinking about thinking about that this morning that while it's easy for us to sit around and and be sort of frustrated that the whole world hasn't got breeding bees and using them really well it is relatively early days in level in the terms of technology where like sort of 20 years ago half the traits that we're probably talking about today weren't weren't that clear or weren't that well measured so we've got we've come a long way as an industry and it's and i think that's that rate is improving and that's yeah so i think we are we are well placed and we'll just get better as the information gets better and as our data sets grow there's traits like like the traits that have just been introduced condition score and, and the reproductive traits that um at the moment we haven't well until now we haven't had a lot of data to to base those traits on but once they become a thing then people start measuring them then then we can start understanding them so yeah if, i think yeah, that's about as far as I can take epigenetics. Otherwise, we're into end of the galaxy sort of stuff. Uh, yep, yeah, Emily, we can talk genomics at some point. Um, definitely. Uh, question there, area of data collection, biggest opportunity. Yeah, I think Mark's comment there is about about aligning the what's measured and what's what's been selected for with with the goals of the, the individual people i think heaps of heaps of bad banter about breeding bees comes from from yeah people not selecting the right animals for for what's actually important for them or not measuring the right stuff um i keep using the cattle example here but you go for high growth cows and then put them on the hill and expect them to eat snow grass and live in above the snow line and, and it doesn't work so well because they end up big frame score and we're too lean and so there's yeah, in, in breeding the problem with breeding bases is they work really well and so you get what you wish for quicker than you used to and that's and so you have to be really care for what you wish for is, is the way i look at it if you want to achieve something then there's no doubt in my mind that a, that a breeding bay will make the most rate of genetic gain for that trait but you need to be really clear about do you really want it and what else comes with that trait? Hi, Berg, just following up on that question, is there any sort of documentation around best practice around data collection? Um, things that you should be doing, um, data points you should be collecting to um, measure against various traits? Yeah, I think Gus said they're just redoing the um, the sort of uh, I can't remember what it's called even uh, the book that sort of goes through that in a detail is in what the when to measure things and and what to measure. Gus, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so we're we're working on that. We we've got a document which you can give you now, but we're in the next couple of months we're updating all of that because it's it's out of date and that gives um, tips on how to collect data, when to collect data, and how to get it into the database properly. Yeah, that's the um, data manager's guide. Yes, the reader's guide. A few, a few years old, yeah. I've, yeah. I've, I've been through that. I'm looking for the next level. Or next, next level. Yeah. yeah. That is that, is it, it is a bit outdated, that's for sure. That's why we're updating it. And we're aiming to include a few of those next level bits in there. So um, contact me if you want to talk more about that, Mike. Okay, thanks. Are you on Facebook yet, Gus? 
No, they don't want to be on for some reason. <laughs> oh, they have got standards. The um, uh, Buff's point there around date of birth, yeah. So obviously birth type, rare type are important, but uh, particularly for early traits, then date of birth, uh, I think something that, something that, like you imagine that something that's a lamb born five weeks later at when you average your lambs doing 300 grams a day, there's a massive difference in weaning weights, for example. So yeah, I think um, one of the downfalls of all the technologies around that are sort of making making uh, mothering up a bit easier is is we need to be careful of that we're still getting getting date to birth. And I think yeah, the more again, it's just you're removing error. Where you're leaving error in, then the breeding bees, the the computer's not magic; it can only handle the information we tell it. And if we don't know the date of birth, then that's it'll give you a breeding bee, but it won't be as accurate as it would if you knew exactly when it was born. So for, particularly for early growth traits, it doesn't matter that much for as the further you go away from probably weaning weight, the, the less important it is. But I reckon those early growth traits will for sure. And probably early, even those people that are now scanning, scanning sheep at early post weaning and that sort of stuff, it could be still having an impact. Well, it's an obvious one, Ferg, but it doesn't have more. All that's, pre-birth is it all that follicle stuff and that that early nutrition the first month or two doesn't change it when you share that first micron or whatever it's, it's, it's really just a growth influence is it the date of birth uh you know you would have an impact on those early, yeah for particularly people are yeah shearing at six months that shearing will have an impact as well but um it won't be yeah, well, the, we'll cut the micron wouldn't it yeah yeah although yeah probably will cut although yeah it's the same thing like every bit of variation that you can't account for is just goes into the error bucket and makes your breeding bee less accurate. So the more the people that achieve like that Marina tech data I put up, they're all caught at birth. Um, and so yeah, data birth's been, and so I think, yeah, the more data you've got, the, the better the system can, can generate good information. But, but then there's obviously there's, we are, we live in a world of compromise. That's yeah. Some people will, some people haven't got time to do all that sort of stuff, but we just need to accept that that means that the data is not as good as it could be, but it's way better than, than 40 Ks now on the drafting gate. So for, is with that uh, landmarking weight, you get your first weight if you're not catching at birth, is that what I do? Uh, I've never seen any value in it. And then I get in the odd Twitter stash over it, but um, <laughs> I haven't seen, I haven't seen any, like I've back in my PhD, I did a bit of it and it wasn't correlated with that much. And I couldn't see how I could use it um, other than just measuring. I mean, obviously it's a nice phenotypic measure to understand what a mob's doing. Maybe you can understand that mob on that paddock. Like, so I can see how in a management sense, it might tell you that, that I thought the lambs would do great there, but they're not looking that great. And if you've actually got a number to put that on, then that's something to, to hone your management next year. But I can't see it as a, being a genetic, any great use genetically. I can happy to be challenged on that one. I haven't spent days thinking about it. Uh, so Sophie asked, where do we think, see the future of EBVs and genomics? Will some new tech or industry improvement make certain EBVs irrelevant? Um, what EBVs are we hoping for? Um, I think, yeah, if we go extra long term, I think, there's, there's all sorts of computing technologies which will change lots of aspects of our lives and, and bring those to be one of them. I think uh, what traits are we hoping for? I think all the stuff that's in chain now is, is kind of what we've been after. The more, I think, well, one of the things we wrote in our report for MLA the other day was that yeah, more information around fly strike and, and other health traits, I think is, the more we get on those traits, the better we go. So I think my hope is for more disease trait monitoring um, and more breeding bees around those disease traits because we, I think that's our that's our ticket to to farming going forward. When resistance to chemicals is high, resistance from both the from both our consumers as well as our pests um, is increasing, and so I think we as animal breeders need to be focusing on that. So all the health traits, I think, will become increasingly important. Um, I think the big technological shifts come through machine learning and vision-based vision, vision based machine learning, um, but that's, 
yeah, not something that we see. Ha- well, we're trying to make it happen, but we won't see that for a little while. If anyone I'll ask has- us a question, Philip. Yep. If he's still there, is he? Yep, I'm still here. Leg us. Yep. Just wondering with the new review of the search engines and everything, because it's always frustrated me that important data, um, you don't get your tick on birth dates. The people do the hard yards and do the birth dates and the birth types and things. Never get the ticks on the sort of the, whether the data is being collected on the individual. It's a very good way for commercial guys to know about the quality of the accuracy, I would have thought. It sort of starts at scanning, greasy fleece weight. Five damage, all those sort of later traits, but we've never, it's, I've never found a way to find anyway whether that stuff's been done on the individuals. Is that likely to be incorporated? That's a, a common question we get about um, how we display data. And we've started a data quality index project. So the initial part of that is looking at the differences between flocks and how they collect data, and then relating that to actually what the predicted response in the progeny is and the heritability of traits. So we can look at different flocks which have good data quality and see if they have differences in actually what's been predicted. And then, so if that's something which is useful, then that is something we, we can look at to, to help um, with flocks which don't have good quality, like you say, how they can improve, and then maybe potentially use that to display for flocks which have good data quality. So that's a project which is going now um, Agbu is working on that as we speak. Uh, question from question from Mark's iPad. Trying to see Mark's iPad. Can't see one. Um, uh, does Ferg's book contain a list of data collection points and the levels of significance of each data? Yeah, kind of. Um, yeah, so the question is around whether we it's around the data collection points and which one has value and so therefore yeah, which one's what's gold standard but what's practical. Um, probably nothing summarized enough, and I think that's this is an easy cop out, but it is probably in, de- determined by the individual. Um, everyone has a slightly different version of what they think is fair um, in terms of what information to collect. So I guess we try and deal with that individually and for our clients, we work with that, and then others um, be contact either the service provider or Sheep Genetics to, to hone in on that. But um, we can look into that, try and make that more more common. Someone has to talk, otherwise we just look at each other. And that's and that's kind of related to that data quality metric. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Last, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any problem collecting silver quality data if you just don't want to sell it as gold gold standard. Like it's yeah, it's got to be the buyer needs to know what's what somehow. Yeah. How many people are looking at accuracies when they're buying rams, bulls? Few people so. So some of that stuff is some of that you can account for by the accuracy of the trait, but you need to be need to be, I guess, focused on what knowing what's good accuracy and what's bad accuracy for an individual trait. People get a little bit annoyed that a NLW breeding value or an index has a low accuracy, but that's just the reality of of that individual breeding value index. So it still might be good. It's just just not as good as it is for something like post weaning weight or fleece weight that's that's good because it's got a solid it. Well, it's got a it's got a solid heritability in there and enough data collected. So, question just then: uh, What is good accuracy? And that's very much dependent on the trait uh, or by the trait. And so, accuracy is or well, the threshold of accuracy is determined uh, by the heritability essentially. So, low heritable traits have by definition a low accuracy. Um, so, if, for most of your traits, whether it's sort of 35, 40 percent heritable, you'll see young rams that are around 70%, 65 to 70% accuracy quoted on them, which is a perfectly good accuracy to make a selection decision. If you're buying a few rams or a few a few bulls or whatever, that's, um, and then for 
the lower the heritability of the trait, the lower that accuracy threshold becomes, or lower the accuracy you'll accept. But if you're a ram breeder and you'll want to make one decision, um, uh, then you need to, you can't afford error as much. So you'll go for a sire that's got a few progeny on the ground and the accuracies are higher generally, or you'll take the, you'll have a crack at the Marino Casino and, and just, and understand that you might, you might win or you might lose on that. Uh, Jules, with accuracies, uh, you're just talking about traits like NLW having a low accuracy. If a trait like NLW that is recorded very well, um, up to say Buff Standard, for example, it still has a low accuracy compared to a highly heritable trait like Micron, might have a much higher accuracy but still badly recorded. Is there a way of differentiating the two? Uh, so if, if I say it again, if the gold standard of data collection is used, yeah, and we're comparing Micron and NLW, NLW will have a much lower accuracy even though it's been collected perfectly. Um, but if we have a trait that's not been collected very well, not very accurately, it's going to affect the accuracy. How do we differentiate between <laughs> traits with higher accuracy that still have poor collection systems? Yeah, it's kind of got to be compared within trait, I suppose. So you need to understand, like you could go right into it and know the heritability of each trait, or you could just say that on, if I look up all the size, in a couple of different catalogs, and this is, this is a ram that's been measured for that trait and has got progeny and has got pedigree there. And this is roughly the accuracy you'd expect. And so that'll be for micron, that'll be 70 odd. Um, and, but if you see a micron breeding value, that's accuracy of 50%, then you know that it hasn't been measured for the trait or doesn't have any pedigree, but, but it's still more accurate than a low accurate NLW because of the high heritability of the trait. So it's, so we can't get away from the fact that we're expecting low, her, low accuracies on the trait, but you can take, you can still buy five rams on a low accuracy NLW data and expect that that's what you'll get in the in their female progeny from from those rams. So even so, it's still it's still what you can expect to take home in terms of that genetic advantage mm. that you've purchased. It's just that they'll, as they get up to like to be ninety nine percent, obviously they've got to have thousands of progeny. Um, and as they get closer to that, we get closer to the true breeding value. But but to make money to shift production systems to do amazing things all of us uh, on the screen and elsewhere have done it on 65 percent accurate sort of data and have made amazing gains it's just obviously you don't get every decision right but you're you just reduce the risk of making a bad decision mm. good point jill accuracies are well explained in our course good plug there <laughs> it goes back a little bit to what I was asked us before, doesn't it, though, Ferg? Like, you're right, that you expect the heritabilities of NLW to be low because it's the nature of the trace and the, her and the um, heritability of it. The frustration seems to be with it, they're even generated. You often will say, well, here's something worth looking at, and you look it up and you realise that there's no Dame pedigree. Uh, it's about a threshold of where, like, there's got to be a threshold where it is useful for industry. Yeah. And uh, if, and you can't see, it, that's just my frustration. Or if I ask us a question, if you could see that it at least had a date of birth and things, you'd know the guy was a bit hardcore and there might be some merit in it at this stage. So it's not, you expect the number of lambs to be low because it's not a very heritable trait. Yeah, yeah. So but I think there's no way now as the layman to work out, is it low but got some merit or, yeah, because they're, they're generated on some fairly poor data sometimes. Yeah, I guess there is obviously thresholds, so it won't be quoted as a breeding vein unless it meets the accuracy threshold, but then there's things get, yeah, you can obviously higher and lower from that threshold. Um, and so, yeah, there's a standard standard calculation I use with using the heritability to, to work out what the threshold for the trade is. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the more information, and maybe we need to, provide some sort of guidelines as to what's good for that particular trait, like what you can expect from if it's that trait and it's been met, if it's got, got sire and damn pedigree and it's, um, and they've both been measured for the trait or whatever, then this is a sort of accuracy to expect, which might give you a bit of a feel for what, what's good and what's bad, um, which is kind of okay in your case, Buff, like we kind of get to know that, but for the average punter coming in, that's 
not booking it every day, it, it gets pretty confusing. And that's Mark's point there that, um, so we should, should just not tell anyone and just uh, the, not tell the clients the accuracy and just because it confuses everybody. And I think, I think that's probably not the, the best outcome. We just need to, I think most people probably just glaze over at the accuracies, but we do need to, um, it is important because you can be buying a RAM that's great on breeding value, but it's, but it's lower accuracy than one that like if you're if you're paying a bit more money for one that's one kilo heavier on on a breeding value, but the accuracy is lower, then you might it might not be the best investment. So I think it is important that we try and as an industry explain it. I understand that breeding values in their own sense can be a foreign language, and so if we start adding different dialects to the foreign language, it makes it tough. But I guess that's what we're trying to do is to is to make it all accessible to to people that only do this one or two days a year and that's and any comments like these and systems are, are well uh, we love hearing so we can try and put systems in place to help people do that because the uh we accept that most people aren't on this line they're actually going to be thinking about rams about the minute before they turn up at the ram sale or balls um and so and we'll be trying to remember what they learnt three years ago at a bread well fed well or something and so yeah we need to we need to have a system that well and that's what I guess a lot of the industry trainings about is trying to help people make this stuff more common, but it's not, it's uh, yeah, it's an ongoing challenge. Any other comments or we'll call it quits. That's twice I've seen Mark Urgut use an iPad. <laughs> Can't even get a smile at him, Georgia. Yeah, so Emily's saying we should have geared it up a bit today rather than going through slides again. Happy to take that feedback. And happy to, yeah, anyone second that motion would be fine. Happy to hear that. Um, Sophie asked what's next week chat. So there is no more chats now. So um, the course is, uh, we're closing out the course on Sunday night. Um, and then those people who have signed up by then will have three more Zoom sessions once they've uh, over through the, through June, basically, as people are doing the course and we've got questions. So just provide some feedback. The course will still be available, but those Zoom calls are part of the initial initial, initial uh, uh, push for that for that course. So anyone that signed up by end of close of business, well, midnight Sunday, um, we'll have three more of these sessions, but we'll be more specific to to the material we've put into the into the course. So this is the last for these ones for a while, but we do this every fortnight for our for the clients. Right, eh? we might um, might pull the pen. Thanks all for your time, and we'll see you somewhere, COVID free. <laughs>